My name is Mark Williams-Thomas. I'm a British TV investigative reporter and criminologist. I exposed one of Britain's most notorious sex offenders, Jimmy Savile, and have been at the centre of investigating some of the largest criminal investigations over the last three decades. I have my own TV crime series on ITV and Netflix called The Investigator. But I'm delighted to tell you that in June 2021, CrimeCon comes to the UK. If you're from the US, you will already be aware of this fantastic event. If you are a true crime fan, this is the event for you. So follow the link below, join me, other experts, survivors and family members at this fantastic event, CrimeCon, June 2021. See you there. In Minnesota, a gruesome murder left few clues behind. A local drug boss became a suspect. But he was well insulated against police. FBI agents and local detectives had to infiltrate a dangerous cartel okay, go ahead, to get to a pair of gangsters who killed with no remorse. A burning body in a dark alley shed light on a cold-blooded killer. His partners in crime would tell the story if they lived. In the underworld of the drug trade, even a childhood friend can quickly become an enemy. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. A trail of drugs and money led FBI agents to a murderer who underestimated the power of forensic science. June 24th, 1990. At about 3 a.m., a St. Paul, Minnesota resident was enjoying the quiet of a summer evening when he noticed a car drive into the alley behind his house. Moments later, he heard the distinct sound of a fire erupting, then the car speeding away. Checking the alley, he discovered a large object engulfed in flames. He feared the fire would ignite his property. He called 911. St. Paul emergency units responded. When firemen extinguished the flames, they realized it was more than an act of vandalism. The object was a charred human body wrapped in a melted plastic tarp. Homicide detectives arrived at the scene. They questioned the resident, but he hadn't seen the car or who was in it. Police found no identification on or near the body. Investigators hoped an autopsy would provide more information. If they could identify the victim, it might help lead them to those responsible. A medical examiner determined the victim was a black male in his mid-twenties and that he was dead before the fire was set. Cause of death, multiple gunshot wounds to the head. The examiner extracted three small caliber slugs they would be sent to the ballistics lab for examination. Despite the fire damage, the examiner found powder burns on the victim's head, indicating he'd been shot at point-blank range. If enough of his fingerprints remained, they might help identify him. The prints were entered into the automatic fingerprint identification system 
APHIS is a national database containing the prints of 23 million persons. The body had probably been burned to make identification difficult. With the APHIS technology, it might be possible. But running the prints would take some time. Police believed such a gruesome murder was probably drug-related. The Minneapolis-St. Paul area had recently become a popular import spot for narcotics. With the drugs came an increase in violent crime. Special Agent John Tyndall of Minnesota's Bureau of Criminal Apprehension investigated drug running in the area. The primary way that people moved cocaine into the state at that time would have been through public transportation, that being either by bus or by airplane. Police created drug interdiction teams assigned to the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport to try to stop the influx. Agents monitored travel to and from cities like Miami and Los Angeles where the drugs originated. Their job was to spot drug traffickers among legitimate passengers. On June 25, 1990, the day after the body was recovered in the alley, agents were watching the counters where same-day tickets were issued. These two guys approached the ticket agent and stood there for quite some time doing what we felt was negotiating the sale of some tickets. They pulled out a wad of cash, and they paid cash for the tickets. They then left the ticket counter. The agents would check at the counter and learn that the men were flying under the names Jeffrey English and Harry Babs. Agents caught up with the men at their gate as they waited to board their flight. They asked if they would answer some questions. We explained to them that they had no obligation to talk to us if they didn't want to. They weren't under arrest, they were free to leave. Both men consented to be interviewed and said they were just heading back home to L.A. They said they had come to St. Paul to visit a friend named Ken Jones. The officers asked for permission to search the bags they'd checked at the counter. Both agreed, so a search warrant was unnecessary. The bags hadn't been loaded onto the aircraft yet. Inside the one belonging to Jeffrey English was a plastic bag containing rolls of cash totaling $13,000. All right, got it. Tucked into a shoe was a 22 caliber Derringer pistol. It would have been easy to miss. It was a tiny revolver, five round capacity, with a barrel that was only one inch long. And the entire gun was approximately four inches long, a gun that could be concealed simply by palming it in your hand. In the other bag was another handgun. Neither had been declared. That violation, plus the suspicious amount of cash, provided enough probable cause for an arrest. Officer Moss, we need to the officer radioed his partner. Be aware they could be armed and dangerous. They had to detain Babs and English before they took off. The plane was still at the terminal. The agent boarded the plane and found the men already seated. In a later interview, English would claim that the money was from selling a car. He said he bought the 22 Derringer on the street in Minneapolis. And he went on to add that he had no idea where the gun had been. I thought that was a strange response for a person to back away from the gun's history. And that was the first inclination that either of us had 
that uh, the gun might have been used in some type of crime, simply by the way he framed his response to the question. Agents became more suspicious when English admitted he was flying under a false name. His real name was Jeffrey Barnes. There was no evidence against Barnes or his companion for anything but misdemeanor weapons violations. Both men paid fines and were released. Their guns were held until agents could check police records to see if they'd been used in earlier crimes. Two weeks later, St. Paul police received the fingerprint comparison from the man found burned in the alley. There was a match from Southern California. The victim's name was Duan Walker. The 26-year-old Los Angeles area resident had a record for intent to sell narcotics. Walker's death made the papers in his hometown. His uncle read the article and called the St. Paul authorities. Operator. St. Paul police, please. He told detectives his nephew had gone there to meet a man named Ken Jones. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your information. We appreciate that. Yes, officer, my name is... When Walker didn't return from St. Paul, the uncle had contacted Jones, who said Walker had already left. It's going to be a big help. All right. Bye-bye. I think I have the folder right here. St. Paul narcotics detectives were familiar with Jones. They had been investigating him for years. He was reputed to be the largest supplier of cocaine in the region. Jones was careful with his drug business and well insulated against investigation. Thanks everyone on behalf of the neighborhood development board, we'd like to give a big round of By publicly donating to urban charities, Ken Jones also portrayed himself as a community benefactor. Police knew it was a cover. Like his legitimate businesses they believed he used to launder drug money. His reputation was different on the street. Among dealers and addicts, Jones was known to rule his interests with an iron fist. If he didn't get paid, people got hurt. For years, detectives had been searching for a way to shut the drug boss down. Detectives knew that murder victim Duan Walker was with Jones before his death. If they could prove the dealer was involved, they could finally take him off the street. But they needed more evidence. Investigators went to interview employees of Jones's business. Hi, can I help you? They hoped someone would know about Jones no. meeting Duan Walker. Never seen him before. Never seen this person at all? Uh-uh. But none Doesn't of the employees were willing to talk. Drug boss Ken Jones continued his narcotics trafficking. He seemed to be beyond the reach of the law. On June 24, 1990, St. Paul authorities had found the body of 26-year-old Duan Walker burning in an alley. Just before his death, he had met with drug boss Ken Jones. Police believe Jones was involved in the murder. But witnesses wouldn't talk, and no physical evidence implicated him. Investigators got an unexpected break three months later when St. Paul police stopped a man for a routine traffic violation. A computer check revealed there was a warrant out for the arrest of Charles Shuck. Police took him into custody. 
They contacted the investigator who had issued the warrant, Special Agent John Tyndall of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. The arrest warrant was issued for Charles Shuck for importing two kilos of cocaine. We attempted to find him at the address that he had given, and he wasn't there. And we had no way of knowing where he was at that time. Several months earlier, a drug interdiction team at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport had spotted the courier. They watched Chuck pay cash for a full fare last-minute ticket to Los Angeles. That would be one way round trip. Round trip. Round trip. Yeah. Chuck didn't check a bag and Six carried seven. only one onto the plane. Boarding pass here. The next day, agents saw him return. Now with two bags. They knew couriers often had extra bags when returning from a drug pickup. How you doing, sir? I'm Officer Moss. Officer General. They told Chuck that they could not arrest him, but they could hold his luggage for inspection. Authorities could not open his bags without his consent, and he did not give it. You're not hiding anything, are you? Chuck's response was not that of innocent travelers. If you tell them that you're going to detain their bags, typically, if they have nothing to hide, they want to stay with their bags. They don't want to leave those bags behind. Chuck had none of that. He had no questions. He had no concerns. His, his primary concern was getting out of there just as fast as he could. Shortly after Chuck left, a canine unit examined the bags. One was clean, but in the other, the dog smelled narcotics. You can't get a search warrant based strictly on the actions of the dog. The dog was an integral part of it in the request for the search warrant, but it wasn't the only part. We also had to detail the fact that we had seen Chuck the previous night come in by a high dollar round trip ticket to Los Angeles with return flight being the following morning. These things are unusual. The fact that he carried one small bag on the aircraft and carried two off is also unusual. Agents secured a search warrant to open the bags. Inside, they recovered two kilos of cocaine. Investigators suspected Shuck was carrying the drugs for someone else. At that time, we weren't able to make a connection as to who he might be working with or working for. But my gut feeling was that he was a courier for somebody at a higher level. Now that he had been arrested, Chuck learned of the evidence against him. He had his attorney propose a deal. In exchange for sentencing consideration, he would give up information on the man he ran drugs for. More importantly, he would also provide details about the unsolved murder of Duan Walker. Shuck said that the man who employed him as a courier was the same man who had ordered the murder. The man's name was Ken Jones. For every kilo of cocaine delivered, Ken Jones would pay Shuck $1,000. Shuck had worked for the drug boss since high school. It was precisely because their relationship was so strong that Jones did not retaliate for the lost cocaine. But Shuck was not the only courier. Jones' girlfriend also played a major role in the trafficking organization. Charles Shuck told me that she was intimately familiar with his drug dealing operation. In fact, she had been a stewardess for an airline for a lot of years and had acted as a courier for him bringing in kilos when she was working as a stewardess. Investigators asked Shuck if the girlfriend knew about the murder. He said that around the time Walker was killed, she had been very upset. She told him that Jones had ordered her to clean up the bathroom of his condo. What's going on? 
There was a great deal of blood by the bathtub. By the way, Chuck had heard Walker had been shot there. He said the killer's name was Jeffrey Barnes, an enforcer for Jones, and the same man whose suitcase held $13,000 in cash and a 22 Derringer pistol. He felt that Barnes had shot the victim, Duan Walker, in the head and that left town the following day after being paid by Ken Jones for that hit. Shuck alleged that the $13,000 cash that was found in the suitcase was at least part of the hit money that was paid to Barnes by Jones for doing the hit, and that the 22 caliber revolver that was found was the murder weapon. Just know that it wasn't my cocaine. I was just Shuck knew the caliber of the murder weapon and other details of the crime that hadn't been made public. So we felt that there was some credibility on Chuck's part that Barnes and Jones could be considered as legitimate suspects in the murder of Walker. Agents realized they might have the murder weapon already in custody. Let's see what we got here. If they could prove it was the gun that killed Duan Walker, they could move forward with the murder case on drug boss Ken Jones and his enforcer Jeffrey Barnes. Let's take it. They retrieved the 22 caliber Derringer from the evidence locker. Investigators sent the Derringer to the St. Paul Ballistics Lab for testing. Examiners compared grooved striations inside its barrel to the grooves on the slugs removed from the victim. But their report was disappointing. The results were inconclusive, in part due to the fact that it only had a one-inch barrel. And the opportunity to pick up striations from the lands and grooves within this barrel were limited. The longer the barrel, the better the opportunity to pick up the striations. A short barrel like this gives you very limited opportunity. Without a forensic examination matching Barnes's gun to the bullets that killed Walker, authorities had only the word of a drug smuggler to bring to trial. Agents shipped the gun to the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Lab in Washington, D.C. The feeling was that their laboratory was somewhat more sophisticated. They were accustomed to doing things like that on a routine basis. And with their sophisticated equipment, they might be able to come up with a determination that was more specific. After it was examined by ATF, they came to the conclusion that it was, in fact, the weapon that was used to murder Duan Walker. Investigators now knew that enforcer Jeffrey Barnes was in possession of the murder weapon the day after Walker was killed. But they still had no proof that he had fired the fatal shots or that Ken Jones had ordered the hit. Excuse me, ma'am. Agents and detectives sought witnesses who could connect the two men to the homicide. Could you take a, take a look at the picture? Whether due to loyalty or fear, authorities were met with silence. One after the other, the people we attempted to talk to would not talk to us, and they would not give up anything. So we were back to the point of having only the statement given to us by Charles Shuck and no palpable way of corroborating any of the information that he gave us through other witnesses. Investigators applied for a warrant to search Jones's condominium, but the judge refused to grant one because they couldn't corroborate the story of the blood on the floor. Information from the pen registers all supports it. After almost a year, investigators realized that the case would not be solved without additional resources. They contacted the St. Paul FBI's Drug Task Force for assistance. Having worked narcotics for 20 years, Sergeant Tom Donaski was well aware of the reputations of Ken Jones and Jeffrey Barnes. Both of them were very intimidating and imposing individuals. They had a violent background. And when we'd go and interview people, everyone would pretty much 
try to avoid either having contact with us or they wouldn't tell us the straight story. The task force believed that the only way to get to the drug boss and his enforcer would be through a cooperating witness. They needed to find someone who could give them first-hand information and perhaps solicit a taped confession. The investigator approached a confidential informant he had developed on earlier cases. The informant couldn't place Barnes with the victim. But he did know that the enforcer had a nephew who had recently been released from prison. The nephew's name was Russell Barnes, known on the street as ICE. After leaving prison, he had come to St. Paul to begin dealing cocaine with contacts provided by his uncle, Jeffrey Barnes. The nephew was anxious to make money. Agents hoped to use his eagerness to their advantage. Investigators developed a new strategy in the fall of 1992. The enforcer's nephew would become their new target. FBI Special Agent Grant Beesey, a specialist in wire intercepts, was called in as part of the plan. We went after Russell, number one, because he was a pretty good-sized dope dealer. And number two, he dealt with his uncle, Jeffrey, and uh, we felt that if we could uh, get a case made against Russell, that would help us make a case against Jeffrey. To get him, agents would somehow have to infiltrate the closed ranks of a dangerous drug underworld. In 1992, investigators believed a St. Paul drug boss and his enforcer had killed Duan Walker. They had already recovered the murder weapon. But Sergeant Tom Donaski, assigned to an FBI drug task force, needed corroborating evidence in order to arrest drug boss Ken Jones and his enforcer, Jeffrey Barnes. Just having the weapon alone wasn't enough to get him prosecuted for it. But we felt that we're going to have to identify some people or bring some people in to court that will be able to testify that Jeff Barnes and Ken Jones were involved, you know, in the murder. FBI Special Agent Grant Beesey believed that if they first arrested the enforcer's nephew, drug dealer Russell Barnes, he might provide the information they needed. We had sources of information that uh, were close to Russell that gave us uh, the indication that he knew uh, that his uncle had uh, committed the murder. We didn't know to what extent that Russell knew about it. To build a narcotics case against Russell Barnes, the FBI enlisted a trusted informant with credibility on the street. And I can hear what I'm saying coming back through here. All right. Agents wired the informant, who would engage in controlled drug buys with the enforcer's nephew. Task force members would record each buy. It was a risky operation. If the informant's wire was discovered, he would likely be killed. Agents wanted to build trust and avoid any possibility that Russell Barnes might suspect it was a setup. At first, the informant bought small amounts. Over time, the transactions increased in size and frequency, and each was recorded. But Russell Barnes refused to speak about his knowledge of the murder. 
agents were no closer to solving the crime. The FBI needed to plant someone closer to the enforcer himself. In May of 1993, they discovered their way in. An informant working for the St. Paul FBI on another case mentioned that he and Jeffrey Barnes had done time together. He claimed they were very close and that Barnes trusted him. He said he was sure he could get Barnes to sell him cocaine and to talk about the Duan Walker murder. So, um, you know Barnes really well. Agents tested the informant's credibility by having him call the enforcer. Within moments, it became clear Jeffrey Barnes was comfortable talking to the informant. No, I've been out a couple of months now. I'm still in the business. You know me. It was the break investigators were looking for. Now they needed to find a place for the drug buys, a controlled environment that could be adequately wired. I've been eating well. Uh, at the time, the informant was uh, living with a, a relative and uh, couldn't really do things at his home. Uh, we obtained a, uh, a house uh, from HUD and uh, moved the informant into the house. And the informant agreed to record certain conversations that he might have with Jeffrey Barnes. Investigators set the informant up in a government-owned house on the west side of St. Paul. He was to contact the FBI any time the enforcer was planning to visit the house for a drug deal. FBI technicians wired the house with electronic listening devices in three rooms. Agents knew Barnes liked to boast about being a hitman, referring to himself as Murder Incorporated. With that information, we tried to encourage the informant to try to bring him to a point where he would talk to him about, you know, acts of violence that he was involved in and things like that. And this is something that Jeff Barnes' reputation was all about and it's something that he liked to brag about. Uh, Agents coached their informant on how to draw Barnes out about the murder of Duan Walker. He was to lead the enforcer into talking about the hits he had performed in the past. In one tape conversation, the informant pretended he wanted Barnes to help him rob a drug dealer. Jeffrey Barnes suggested that they just kill him. Barnes told the informant that doing a hit on somebody is not a problem. And he described uh, how he could do it. He would walk up behind the individual, pop him in the head with a handgun, let him fall on the uh, floor, wrap him in plastic, and uh, drag his body outside and put it in an alley. Um, and this was uh, the exact same way that uh, Duan Walker had been uh, killed. Look, don't want to take up too much of your time. Let's see if we get down to business. It was good circumstantial evidence, but by itself, it wasn't enough. Okay. I got you, buddy. Because the buys had been arranged by telephone, investigators secured a warrant to tap the suspect's phone lines. Although the wire intercepts captured no information on the Walker murder, they did produce details of the drug operation. In January 1994, the task force decided it was time to arrest Russell Barnes and hope he would turn on his uncle. On January 29th, they set up another controlled drug buy with an informant. It would happen at a downtown St. Paul hotel. 
Investigators wired the room for sound. You can go. Okay. The reliability of the eavesdropping devices was essential. Testing, one, two, one, two. The recordings would be used in court. And agents would be monitoring from an adjacent room. If Russell Barnes discovered the setup, they would be able to protect their informant. Okay, go ahead and give me a signal. Testing, one, two, three. When Mary the room was ready, the they would have the informant call the enforcer's nephew and order several ounces of cocaine. Mary had a little lamb. Testing, one, Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little Investigators lamb. Investigators in St. Paul Police Special Investigations Unit were conducting the surveillance at Russell Barnes' residence. And after the phone calls were made, with very short delay, Russell went to the hotel. Russell Barnes had delivered to the informant before. He brought cocaine and the equipment he needed for measuring it. He suspected nothing. To him, it was just another deal. He set up shop and began the transaction, unaware that every word was being recorded. It was important to get a drug dealer off the streets. But what agents really wanted was for Russell Barnes to give a statement about drug boss Ken Jones and enforcer Jeffrey Barnes committing murder. When details of the drug deal were on tape, investigators moved in. Okay, we're clear. They had indisputable evidence of Russell Barnes selling roughly two ounces of cocaine. On your knees. Investigators explained to him that as a three-time narcotics offender, Russell was looking at a minimum of 15 years in prison. They wanted a statement about his uncle. Right, Barnes. We sat him down and we talked at some length about uh, Jeffrey Barnes and his involvement with the Dwan Walker homicide. Being somewhat reluctant because this was his uncle, it took some persuasion and after a while we gained his confidence and he eventually told us his knowledge of, about the Dwan Walker homicide. What happened with Walker? <laughs> Walker. Jeffrey Barnes had told him Walker tried to steal cocaine from Ken Jones. Took my gun, I put it to his So head. they killed him. Pow! The enforcer said they then dumped Walker's body in an alley, doused it with gasoline, and lit it a fire. Nobody messes with my money. It was, at best, a secondhand <laughs> confession. <laughs> Nobody messes with my Drug money. operation. And Russell Barnes was taken into custody. All right, let's go. Stand up. Agents also right. arrested their informant, so no one would know he cooperated. Discovered a 22 code. I'm like, what well, I'm working on. Record. Drug boss Ken Jones was still on the street. Yes. As was his enforcer, Jeffrey Barnes. Pop but the FBI task force was closing in. By 1994, while trying to dismantle a Minnesota drug ring and solve a four-year-old murder, the FBI and St. Paul police had arrested dealer Russell Barnes, who agreed to cooperate. He offered details on the crimes committed by his uncle Jeffrey Barnes, including nationwide drug trafficking and the 1990 murder of Duan Walker. According to Sergeant Tom Donaski, Investigators had plenty of evidence against Jeffrey Barnes, a known enforcer for drug boss Ken Jones. We've got a weapon that's been recovered at the airport. We've got Jeff Barnes making a comment to one of our informants that he, this is how you murder somebody. That's a dope ripoff type of situation. And the actual procedure that he went through when he killed Juan Walker, and now we have his nephew 
telling us that he's been at his house, blood relative, that we're going to have testify in court that he actually told him about the murder. In August 1994, investigators staked out the apartment where Jeffrey Barnes was staying. They knew the enforcer was often armed and willing to kill. He had no time to react. Freeze! Please stop! Put your hands up on the car. Come on, move! Move! Put your hands on the car. Prosecutors did not yet charge him with murder. They went forward with a drug conspiracy case instead. You have your other hand. Dealing drugs to his ex-cellmate earned Barnes 30 years in prison. They would hold the murder case until they had more evidence against him and Ken Jones. Special Agent Grant Beesey believed having Barnes in prison would make witnesses more willing to talk. Jeff Barnes had the reputation of being an enforcer. He scared people. Uh, we felt that getting him off the street would uh, take away the intimidation factor um, against some of these other people. And it would be better uh, for us to be able to talk to these, these other folks with him being locked up. The plan worked. After Barnes's arrest, investigators met with an associate of Ken Jones. Facing a long prison term on drug charges, he offered to be a government witness. He said he had extensive knowledge about Jones's drug cartel and that he had met Duan Walker just before his murder. In mid-June 1990, Jones had ordered the cooperating witness to drive a pickup truck to St. Louis, where he was to meet Walker. The truck had been fitted with a second fuel tank. Upon arrival in St. Louis, Duan Walker stuffed several bags of cocaine into the false tank. When full, the tank held about 30 kilos of the drug. That amount of cocaine would have been worth more than a million dollars. The cooperating witness then drove the truck back to St. Paul, where he turned it over to the drug boss. Walker had arrived earlier and was staying with Jones at his condominium. Jones hadn't paid Walker for the drugs yet. In fact, he and his enforcer decided not to. And the two of them conspire to take the dope and to eliminate the problem and just execute uh, Dwan Walker. That's, that's Bo, Dwan. The witness's testimony would explain the motive for the killing. He told the agents that several days later he got a call from the drug boss. He was ordered to come over to the condo immediately. It was Sunday morning, June 24th, 1990, the day following Duan Walker's murder. Ken Jones seemed very nervous. He ordered the cooperating witness to get rid of the truck he had driven up from St. Louis, the one with the false gas tank. The drug boss demanded that no one be told about the cocaine run. The witness said Jones's girlfriend had also told him about cleaning up blood in the bathroom after the murder. In this picture, you recognize this Do you swear to tell the truth? In the summer of 1995, prosecutors convened a grand jury to secure witness testimony under oath. Jones's girlfriend was subpoenaed to testify. But she denied telling anyone that she cleaned up blood in Jones's sure bathroom. What you're talking about. I never cleaned up any blood. The Ken Jones. If authorities bathroom. couldn't prove she was lying, they might never be able to indict Ken Jones and Jeffrey Barnes for murder. No, sir. If you would tell us, please, about the In June 1995, grand jury testimony from others proved that one witness perjured herself when she denied cleaning up blood in the bathroom of drug boss Ken Jones. I'm not sure what you're talking about, sir. On June 21st, 
the grand jury indicted Jones and his main enforcer, Jeffrey Barnes, for the 1990 murder of Duan Walker. Barnes, the alleged hitman, was already in prison on drug charges. The day after the indictment, investigators staked out the home of drug boss Ken Jones. Although he had insulated himself well against the investigation, Ken Jones was finally arrested for murder. Cover. FBI Drug Task Force member Sergeant Tom Donaski was determined to find physical evidence to back up witness testimony at the trial. Through the investigation, everything focused on the fact that uh, Dewan Walker was murdered in the, in the bathroom and he was shot in the head there. I was thinking that we might be able to still find a trace of blood in the grouting on the floor in the bathroom. Bureau of Criminal Apprehension Technicians processed the bathroom. After Jones was arrested, new tenants had moved into the condo. They gave their consent for the search. The technicians tested for the presence of blood using luminol, a relatively new technique at the time. Luminol reacts with proteins in blood rendering minute traces of it visible under ultraviolet light. We were able to determine on the underlayment underneath the tile that there was a significant amount of blood. They were unable to obtain a DNA off that test, but they were able to obtain a test that showed that it was a significant amount of blood and it was human blood that was still uh, traceable back even five years. Mr. Barnes, Mr. Jones. It was the evidence investigators needed. On October 31st, 1995, Ken Jones and Jeffrey Barnes went to trial in St. Paul. Prosecutors outlined what they believed occurred in Duan Walker's final hours. These two gentlemen here are responsible for all of this. Walker had delivered roughly 30 kilos of cocaine to Jones. The drug boss decided he didn't want to pay. That night, he and his main enforcer, Jeffrey Barnes, partied with Walker. Eventually, Walker headed into the bathroom. Jones and Barnes had planned the hit to take place there. Duan Walker was unarmed. Barnes fired three shots from his 22 caliber Derringer. As always, Jones maintained his distance. Walker died immediately. Later that night, they wrapped Walker's body in plastic sheets to contain the blood and loaded it into a car. They drove to an alley and dumped the body. To make identification more difficult, they doused the body with gasoline and set it ablaze. Jones used his girlfriend to cover his tracks after the murder. The bathroom floor was covered with blood particularly the area around the tub where Walker had fallen. She was able to clean the surface, but blood had seeped down into the subflooring. Five years later, technicians would find it there. You will come away with the inescapable conclusion. Ken Jones and Jeffrey Barnes were convicted of murder and drug charges. There has been no In March 1996, they were both sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Of these gentlemen through the years. 
Jeffrey Barnes, who had once boasted he was Murder Incorporated, was no longer a threat to those outside the prison system. Ken Jones had tried to create an image of himself as a community leader, but his greed led to murder, and he will never leave prison alive. Thank you.